4, Swissborg. 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 Swissborg est sorti ce matin. They have an app where you can buy crypto. They connect to Binance, HitBTC, LMAX, and Kraken and find the best rates in the markets. What I like about Swissborg is that they have an amazing app that can directly buy cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and also cash out as well. Through Swissborg, all assets will have a fiat gateway. And here is the thing. Premium features gives you zero fee trading. That is zero fees. If you want to buy Bitcoin with fiat, I suggest you buy through Swissborg rather than Coinbase. And if you're interested in trading the likes of Ethereum or Bitcoin, use Swissborg's application. Dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no OBS blockchain channel built with the community and for the community. And today we have another mind-blowing guest, Joe Petrowski from Parity Technologies. We're going to cover the hottest topic of 2021, proof of stake with Polkadot, with Kusama, and tons of really interesting topics in layman terms so that you can understand everything in one single video. But before we kick off, a big shout out to Nate from Crypto Slate, our partners. Thank you so much for these awesome articles. For those out there who do not want to watch the whole video, you can get a summarized article so that you can read and enjoy, but it will be worth every single minute. So without further ado, Joe, thank you so much for coming on the show, buddy. Yeah, thanks for having me, Alex. So first and foremost, Joe, before we talk about Polkadot and Kusama, I would love to hear your personal story, you know, becoming a, a geek, you know, falling in love with this space, if you don't mind. Yeah, I, I think I've always been a geek, so I don't know if I became one, but uh, we could, <laughs> say, uh, becoming a crypto geek. Uh, I think I had a, quite a longer story than, than most people. I, I feel like 95% of the stories I hear, I hear are just like I heard about Bitcoin and then I lost 10 pounds because I didn't eat for a week and I was just reading about Bitcoin. Uh, it, it took me a while, uh, back in like 2011, 12, um, just like a lot of my friends were into it. Um, like Eric Voorhees is a friend of my friend, so I, I would see him around a little bit and um, just kind of like hear about it, look into it a little bit. Um, and then it was actually, when I really got into it, uh, I kept following it for several years, but, and then in like late 2016, uh, I was starting to look for like my next career. I had taken a little bit of a break from engineering to pursue professional cycling. And in late 2016, I was looking to go back into engineering and just trying to look at like, you know, tune up my skills and get back into like some programming and engineering and stuff. And, and my actual like formal background was in data analysis and, and time series analysis. So I started looking for just, hey, what can I kind of crunch time series on and um, kind of came across like algorithmic trading and, and all this stuff and realized that like a lot of the, the methods like covariance methods and stuff were exactly the same as the way that I modeled like shock and vibration. So I started getting getting into that and um, actually realized that like it was really difficult to apply any of this to like traditional equities because like you can't really go to like your normal broker and say like, hey, can you plug me into like the stock exchange API and let me like start actually like running the software. Um, that's a total no go. And, um, you know, crypto exchanges had tons of like free data sets and APIs and all this stuff. Um, so then I was just like, oh yeah, I've been kind of following this crypto. I, I could get it in, into it this way. Um, and so I would say like, yeah, late 20, 2016, early 2017 is when I started to really get into it and um, did a bunch of like trading algorithms and, and software and then got a little bit into like mining, mining and stuff. And then I ended up at Parity uh, in 2018. That's beautiful. And I'm sure the cycling actually helped you become fit to be resistant to this crazy, intense and mad world of ours. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, don't, I don't think crypto is that crazy compared to the world of uh, professional sport. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Definitely. That's a really good point. So I'd love to kick off with, you know, a very important question, you know, for those who are new to learning about Polkadot and Kusama, like, could you give us a very high level layman's terms for my grandma Susie and explain what is Polkadot, what is the mission, what is Kasama, what is the mission, and how they differ between each other. That would be amazing, Joe. Yeah, so Polkadot was an idea that Gavin Wood had back in like also late 2016 about when I was catching up. Uh, Gav was getting ahead of everybody else uh, with this idea of Polkadot. And it really was aiming to solve a couple problems that he saw in the industry. Um, one is like scalability became pretty obvious that like if you have everything running on a single uh, blockchain, then it, it was not going to be very scalable. And so it, the world was trending towards having more blockchains. And so the natural way to, to scale this is to have more blockchains and have them communicate with each other, uh, which a lot of people do through like bridging solutions. But the problem with bridges is that they're not very secure, um, that you still have to 
the chains have to trust each other. So it's very trust-based. And if you have an application that's built on multiple chains, uh, the, the actual trust in the application is the lowest trust of the entire system. So, and when you have like lots of software and, and things that are networked, you tend to have, you know, A depends on B, depends on C, depends on E, um, and, and it kind of keeps going and you can end up with something that has like a very critical vulnerability that way. And so one of the, the key things with Polkadot is that we kind of link all of these things together um, so that they can share some common context and actually have the security where everybody has the has an equal level of security um, so that there's one common level of trust. And when um, when we think about like trust in blockchains, it's always going to be a finite quantity. So like if you think of like proof of work, um, you have all of these CPUs that are kind of like racing to find a solution. Um, there's a finite number of CPUs in the world. So if you add more blockchains, the number of CPUs per blockchain goes down. Same with proof of stake when we talk about using value to secure these chains. Um, if you add more blockchains, value is by definition finite. So you start to spread it thinner. And it doesn't really make sense to kind of keep spreading this these security mechanisms even more and more thin. We want to actually have a system where the incentives and the mechanisms are such that as you add more participants in the system, it actually gets stronger and they contribute to each other's security um, rather than compete for it. So um, this is like one of the, the core pillars of Polkadot is that um, we can provide this context for multiple blockchains to communicate and interact with each other. And the other one, um, which I think is a little bit later on, on our outline today is um, governance and how do we actually evolve this network? Because um, no technology ever stays the same and stays relevant at the same time. It, it always has to evolve and change. Um, and this is very easy in the beginning of a technology when it's just a couple of people, it's a very small community. It's very easy to kind of coordinate and, and communicate um, within that group. But as you get more and more people interested, as there are more stakeholders, you need more formal methods to actually get everybody together and make a decision where everybody feels like their voice was heard. So um, that's one of the like core features we, we designed around was like, we don't just want Polkadot to be one thing. We want it to be something that can evolve and change and let stakeholders um, actually participate in. Um, and, and then I think the other part of your, your question was about Kusama and, and where does yeah. that come in? Uh, so the idea of Kusama actually came quite a bit later than Polkadot. Um, and we, we built this thing that was just insanely complex. Uh, I mean, like you can, you can kind of fit Ethereum in your brain. Like one person can kind of understand all of Ethereum, but um, I don't really think there's anybody that understands all of Polkadot, all the parts of it. It's just very complicated. And so um, you can unit test kind of like all you want, but you need, in order to actually test something, you need to like actually just put it out in the wild and um, like actually like have something at stake and um, really go for it, I guess. Uh, and so that, that was the idea of Kusama was that we actually have, we call them cousins. So um, they are actually different networks. They have different communities. They have different features. We have some features in Kusama that are not in Polkadot, like the society module. Um, and we intend to keep it that way. We intend to keep these chains change different. But also when we want to deploy something on Polkadot, we put it out on Kusama first. So um, we can kind of put a new feature out on um, Kusama and this kind of goes with our like governance and upgradability thing. We can actually like upgrade these chains and put in new features. Um, we put it out on Kusama first, let the community try it out, discover any bugs or problems that might arise, and then we move it into Polkadot. So when something goes into Polkadot, we are really confident that it is production ready and uh, basically flawless. That's really, really well put. So in terms of an analogy for Kusama, would it be safe to say that it's like that little brother rebellious, you know, expect chaos, you know, who's not afraid to test new things, to take risks? Is it kind of like that, that little brother of uh, polka dots or yeah, or that, little that, cousin, as you mentioned? Sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. Um, Kusama is the rock bands and polka dot is the orchestra. <laughs> <laughs> very nice. I'm sure Grandma Susie will understand very well. You mentioned something which is governance, and we're definitely going to touch upon that. That's really important because a lot of people kind of overgeneralize governance and don't look at the different governance models, but also the evolution. But before we jump into that, I would love you to explain to us what a parachain is, because a lot of what a polka dot does is related to parachains. Could you tell us again for Grandma Susie, what is a parachain and why does it matter so much? Yeah, so at the beginning, I kind of mentioned that Polkadot is the system of connecting a bunch of different blockchains together. And a parachain at its most simple level is just one of these blockchains. And, you know, I kind of said at the beginning that we have, it's a system to connect a bunch of blockchains and a parachain is one of these. So what makes a parachain a parachain is 
that it just says it's going to follow the finality of Polkadot's relay chain. So the relay chain is what we call this kind of like central coordinating chain. Um, and it actually doesn't host that much logic itself. The main job of the relay chain is just to validate parachains. So parachains are completely independent. Um, they don't have to have, so a lot of people think of like blockchains as being like for smart contracts or something. Um, there's nothing that says that. So you're actually coding the blockchain itself. And a parachain is just, they can be completely different blockchains. Um, and all they do is they connect to the relay chain and in order to follow its finality. So when a, a parachain is just basically giving up its um, its consensus to the relay chain. So, but it can still have its own custom logic. It can still decide what blocks it wants to produce and add to its blockchain. Um, it just basically uses the relay chain and the rest of Polkadot as a service to finalize it. So the parachain will say, okay, I, I have this new block. I'm gonna give it to the relay chain. Can you give me your like stamp of approval? We're gonna call this one final so that we can build the next set of blocks on top of this. That's really interesting. So in terms of analogies, is like parachain kind of a bridge and the relay chain is someone who's transporting like a, I don't know, a delivery on the other side of, of information to the other side of the bridge? Uh, no, it, it's not a bridge at all. So that's uh, uh, actually maybe a little bit of a, a misnomer in our, in our naming, but the relay chain doesn't actually relay information across it at all. So um, if, if you kind of forget about the interoperability and messaging part for a moment, um, and you just think about a parachain as being its own blockchain, and it's just asking the relay chain to validate it. So it's going uh -huh. to have some logic for how it changes state, right? And so um, a, like a good example would be like if you compare Bitcoin and Ethereum, right? So Bitcoin says, okay, we have this database of um, UTXOs, and a transaction has this format where you basically assign a UTXO to some other address, um, and we can go check that this has a valid signature on it, and that's what a transaction is. Um, whereas Ethereum has a whole other definition of what a transaction is. Um, in Polkadot, every parachain can have its own rules in the system. So a parachain actually comes into Polkadot and it has its rules actually like, it can communicate not just its blocks, but it can communicate its rules to Polkadot. And so it can go into Polkadot and say, hey, I'm a parachain, here are my rules. These are the rules that I want to follow in my parachain. Um, and then here's a block, here's a list of transactions that I actually want to execute and include in my blockchain. And Polkadot will just take those rules and execute that block and say, yes, all of the transactions in that block follow your rules. Um, and the really neat thing is, is that we actually keep the rules in the blockchain itself. So they can't really pull a fast one and like change the rules on people. They have to follow the rules that they've declared from the beginning. Um, and all of these parachains can have different rules. So you can have a blockchain for smart contracts. You can have a blockchain that's just a decentralized exchange. You can have a blockchain um, that's just like an identity chain. Um, and they all have their own rules and specialization. Um, and Polkadot just validates that. So that's the validation part and how the relay chain will like validate the rules from each individual parachain. Um, and then when it comes to messaging, like what you asked about everything going over bridges, um, that's not really scalable. Like if all the messages have to go through this bridge, um, when you add like a hundred or a thousand parachains, um, you know, you can't really have like this bottleneck of every message going through this bridge. So the relay chain still ends up providing the context for chains to send each other messages, um, but it doesn't actually pass the messages themselves. So what it actually does is that you can have chains pass message direct chain to chain, um, but you can put a proof in the actual chain block that shows that you sent this message. And so the message doesn't actually have to go through the relay chain itself. You can ch pass messages chain to chain. Um, and so the relay chain is really just, its job is to validate the pair chains and provide the context for them to send these messages. Awesome. Thank you so much for that, Joe. That's really, really interesting. And you mentioned some topics that we definitely need to follow up on, such as adding DEXs and having different types of DeFi programs or, or, yeah, or apps on top of this chain, which sounds really interesting. But before we go into that, I'd love to follow up on a question related to governance. You know, a lot of people talk about governance, and it's a huge topic these days from proof of work, proof of stake. And uh, I know you guys have really tried to thought of you know, more advanced ways to really bring decentralized governance to the next level. If you don't mind kind of like 
educating us on how decentralized governance has improved and how you see it going in the future to really have the, the best form of it. Yeah, what we ultimately want to do with uh, Polkadot and, and Kusama and, and Web3 in general is enable a new type of society. So when we think about like societies now, we, we tend to think of like nation states or you know, countries and you belong, you're a member of um, this community. Um, and, and you can think of like smaller ones like a state or a city too. Uh, and we really want to enable this idea of like a digital society where you can be a member of it. And in order to do that, you need governance in order to like make this make decisions within the society. Um, and so our model for governance has really, it's married some like philosophical um, like governance design things and some really cool technical breakthroughs. So on the design thing, we, we've made this like multi-cameral system where uh, we have like a council that's on chain and it, it's actually like an elected group of members um, where everybody in, in the network can vote on who they want who they find to be acceptable counselors. And this group is really meant to, to represent the more passive stakeholders, maybe people who don't want to like look into the code on every update or something. The council's responsibility is to do that and make sure that only quality proposals actually get into the governance queue to begin with, um, or that they can reject ones that would be dangerous. Um, this would be like a legislative body. Um, and, and then we have like some other bodies too, like a technical committee um, that can kind of like fast track things. Like if, if there's a bug or something, they can speed things up, but they can't actually make decisions. What this allows us to do is like, first of all, we get, we have a way to like making decisions on chain, um, which, is, which is great. Like a lot of protocols can do that. Um, you know, there's kind of like these very primitive coin voting um, mechanisms that they're not so great because it just rewards like large holders and that's it. Um, whereas like we've designed things to be a little bit more complicated in Polkadot, but such that even small holders can have a, a much larger voice. And um, and the council, the, the basis of that is like one vote per counselor. So um, it doesn't really matter like the funding behind them. So, um, you know, you still have to have like a majority of people on this council to agree to things and, and oftentimes like a super majority. So one of the, the problems with like other on-chain governance systems that only do like a simple coin voting um, or maybe like validator voting like what Tezos does is that you're still actually reliant on some other community to enact the decision. So if you have some governance process of deciding that you want to do like an upgrade or a hard fork, um, you're still relying on a lot of other parties to be involved. You need your miners or validators to update their client. Um, I mean, before the client even exists, like you need a company of developers to actually design a new client, right? You could have your community decide um, that you want to do something. If nobody actually makes it, it, it doesn't matter. Um, then you need like the miners and validators to actually upgrade their client software and start running the upgrade. Um, you need exchanges or like data aggregators like CoinMarketCap or something um, to actually agree, like if there is a hard fork, which one do we call the actual chain, right? Which um, which chain is valid? Um, and so it kind of brings up this question of like who actually has the power, right? You can have like a, a formal or informal system of governance, um, but if you don't actually have a way to enact that decision, it's not really that meaningful. Uh, and that's where some of our like technical um, progress has really had an impact. And so we've actually separated the logic of the chain, which we call the runtime, compared to the actual like node software that validators uh, validators or full nodes would run. So when you do when we do like a, an upgrade to the chain, we don't actually have to have anybody update their software. The rules are on chain. Um, so this is like the same thing that lets the parachain work, right? A parachain can take its rules and say, hey, here's my rules. Can you execute them for me? Um, Polkadot itself hosts its own rules. And so when a validator goes to like validate a block, it's just asking the blockchain, hey, what are the rules? And it's going to execute those rules. So what this lets us do in governance is when we have a community decision to actually make one of these changes, we just actually put the new rules into the chain. And so all of the validators will just start importing those new rules and executing those. And so um, it actually, and then because the rules are like, ugh, because the rules are actually part of the chain's um, storage or consensus, we actually have consensus over what the rules are. So if somebody else does fork off, they're explicitly not following the rules that were agreed upon by the community. So we have this autonomous enactment that actually lets the entire chain act as kind of like an agent itself. Um, 
and, and gives the stakeholders like meaningful voice in the system so that the chain can actually execute on the the will of the stakeholders. So it sounds like, you know, the, the very, the most simplest form of decentralized governance is just a vote, right? A, B, or option one, two, three, four, which is just, you know, the, the actual project and then the, the token holders. And then there's a more sophisticated type of decentralized governance, slightly more sophisticated, where you have people staking and then you have validators. So maybe like a, a dual layer, but here it's an entire society. Is that the difference? It's like a decentralized society with people, multiple parties, multiple layers with different roles specific to their attributes or strengths. And this is all combined together in one decentralized governance. Is that a, a, the right summary, or, or am I off by saying this? <laughs> no, no, that, that's a, that's a good like high level description of it. So, um, yeah, it, it and it completely isolates governance from validators. So this this kind of like confusion comes up a lot because people think like, oh, you know, if I'm nominating this validator, um, are they also going to participate in government governance for me? And the answer is no. Like validator. Validator staking security, all of that is completely isolated from governance. They're completely separate systems. Um, and so it really doesn't give validators any more say than the tokens that they hold. Um, they don't have any option of like deciding not to upgrade their software in order to go against some upgrade. Um, so it really just gives like the entire community a voice and um, anybody who has stake in the system can participate either um, as a counselor or a voter, voting for counselors, voting on referenda, making proposals themselves. Um, it's a completely like open and permissionless system. That's really cool because you're right. Some of the validators or some of the stakers, sometimes they don't really know, they don't have the technical abilities and therefore they don't even want to vote, right? They don't, they're just like, okay, I'll stake because I believe in the vision, but uh, I, I won't get that much involved where here really people can choose something that they understand and, and be a part of the ecosystem. Is that is that right? Right, or their incentives are just different, right? If you're a validator, you might have different incentives than um, if you're just a normal token holder. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Well, uh, we're really looking forward to this. I think decentralized governance, I mean, most people will admit that it's probably one of the most important points of decentralization. So uh, we're really excited to hear that you guys are really trying to go further and, and deeper in terms of creating a decentralized governance for all. Yeah, I, I think so. We, we've had some really cool um, kind of landmarks like Kusama last um, like October or November was the first chain to actually do like a live upgrade where we made a, a change to the protocol and any other blockchain would require a hard fork to have everybody deploy new node software. Um, and we did this without anybody upgrading their actual client software. We just put forward a proposal to put in a new, uh, new runtime, so new blockchain logic. Um, it got voted in and it actually just replaced itself. Um, and then some of the cool things that we're looking towards in the future um, that haven't been done yet would be actually like taking stake in other chains. So we're building a bridge between Kusama and Polkadot. And um, so one of, the, one of the things that we did when we launched Kusama was that Kusama is really like a service to Polkadot, right? It's it's acting as a, we call it a cannery, right? It's a cannery in the coal mine so that we can see um, if there are any problems in our logic before they go to Polkadot. So that's, Kusama's doing something valuable for Polkadot. So um, we made a commitment early on that 1% of the Polkadot tokens will actually go into Kusama. And so we're going to have, we have this like on-chain treasury that governance can manage. And we're actually going to send um, DOT tokens from Polkadot into Kusama. So the Kusama treasury will have DOT tokens. And this is actually really interesting because we have bridged assets between other chains. Like we have Bitcoin on Ethereum, but you still only have um, like an Ethereum account holder that can own this like wrapped token, right? Um, but there's no really, there's no concept of Ethereum as a network being an agent. Like you, you don't think about like Ethereum actually owning some of this Bitcoin. It's just an account on Ethereum that owns it, right? Um, but we're actually going to have the situation where like Kusama itself as a network owns a stake in Polkadot, another network. Um, and this is like a completely groundbreaking thing. Like nobody's done anything like this. It doesn't even really fit in our model, like our mental model of blockchains of like a network being a sovereign agent, just like a nation can like, like a government has its own funds and treasury um, and it can buy assets. And now we're talking about a blockchain itself actually having assets that belong to other blockchains. Um, and that's just, 
it's kind of like the next level of digital societies and management. That's fascinating, Joe. I really look forward to, to seeing that happen someday, hopefully soon. And you just mentioned multi-chains. You just mentioned connecting with other networks. And obviously, I think one of the main goals of Polkadot was to support Ethereum and this ability to scale and ability to provide a decentralized web. Um, I have a quick question, though, related to Ethereum 2.0. Like some people here in London, some senior developers are not so optimistic on the transition. They're, they're quite concerned. Um, what if ETH 2.0 doesn't happen or as well as we expect it would be? Could Polkadot still help, you know, the minimize the damage, basically? Although it's 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 there for interconnectivity, could it also support uh, all these projects if one day they wanted to migrate to Polkadot and, and help us not lose all that momentum? Yeah, absolutely. So we've done a lot of work in um, like compatibility and solutions for applications to to move over to Polkadot. So we have uh, we have a couple projects that are actually integrating the Ethereum virtual machine. So like one of them is Moonbeam, another one is Akala. Uh, we have a bridge to Ethereum one that's called Snowfork. Um, and so this actually has like the EVM and all of the like Web3 RPC endpoints that you would need to connect MetaMask or something to it. So um, we actually put the like Ethereum logic into a parachain on Polkadot and we can just run that there um, because you can host this arbitrary logic. So why not just put Ethereum into one of these parachains? Um, and so we, we're, at a, we're already talking to quite a few teams who are um, looking to, to have a bridge or, or move over to Polkadot. And so we can definitely support that kind of transition. That would be fascinating. In terms of transaction speed, in certain terms of costs, you know, those are probably kind of like the, the biggest kryptonites of Ethereum at the moment. Are those things that Polkadot can solve if, if people just want to migrate? Let's say you talked about DEXs earlier, right? I have a DEX on Ethereum and then I think, okay, I need something more scalable because, you know, people with lower income cannot really use my DEX due to the gas fees. Um, is that something that Polkadot would be able to support and, and, and solve these issues? Yeah, so I mean, part of having this like arbitrary logic is that you can do a lot with like transaction fee models. So if we, if we kind of start from like the transaction speed part first, um, what we're seeing on individual um, substrate based chains, which is like, so substrate's the framework that we use yeah. to build parachains. And um, we, could, we could go down another long road, but um, you can actually build a parachain in any language that compiles to WebAssembly. So we have people working on this in like C++, assembly script, Go, um, a bunch of stuff. So you don't have to use substrate, but um, Practically speaking, it's the easiest way to go. Um, and so transaction speed that we're seeing on Polkadot and like substrate based chains is about 800 to 1000 transactions per second. We actually think we can get about five to 10 X in each chain. So um, five to 10,000 transactions per second per chain. Um, and then these would all be in separate parachains. Um, so if you have like, we think we can have 100 to 200 parachains. Um, I say like 200 is optimistic, 100 is conservative. Um, you could have like five to 10,000 transactions per second on every single one of these chains. Um, and so it, it, it's quite scalable in that sense. And then as far as like a lot of the fees and, and gas stuff, gas is something that's like very specific to smart contract chains. You You need gas because you don't know how many steps to execution there are and you're letting users deploy contracts on the chain, right? So um, gas is really meant to handle this untrusted environment where anybody can put code on your chain to run. Um, and so you need some sort of gas metering, but it's also not very efficient because it's metering. So you have to kind of check every step. Um, do I have gas left? Do I have gas left? Do I have gas left, right? Um, and, uh, and on Polkadot, if you're building a chain that's um, with smart contracts, yeah, you probably need some sort of gas model. But if you have a, a very specialized chain, that only does specific things like uh, a decentralized exchange, um, it probably doesn't need smart contracts. You don't need to let your users actually deploy code. You can put all of the code for this very specialized thing on its own chain. And in, in that sense, you don't actually need to meter the transaction execution. You can just set a fixed fee of, hey, this transaction costs X units in order to execute. And we already know the complexity and the number of steps that it's going to take because it's kind of trusted code, right? The the developers of the project made it, the the community decided to make the upgrade that put this logic into the chain. And so you don't need to meter it. You can test it ahead of time and have a very good sense of how long it takes to execute this transaction, how much, how many resources it takes. And so you can just assign a fixed fee to this. And then you just take the fee ahead of time and you let it go. Um, you don't need to actually meter it. So this actually, 
um, not only like reduces the fees, but it actually speeds things up and lets us have a much higher transaction performance. That's really, really interesting. And, you know, when we talk about off chain, you know, transaction speed, you know, most of the trading engines, as you know, they already do 100,000, 150,000 transactions per second. Is that the ultimate goal? Is it to have like on chain data that can scale or can execute as fast as off chain uh, technology? No. So, I mean, obviously, if you can have it be as fast, then that's great. Um, but it, it's kind of like an arbitrary goal to shoot for. Um, I mean, we obviously want just like the best performance possible. And also like this idea of a transaction is very abstract, right? Um, we, we tend to think of it as like a, a transfer, um, which might be very simple, like, you know, take this account, subtract X, take this other account, add X. Um, but you can actually have these very complicated transactions. And so like one of them is say when the validator set changes, you have maybe, um, 2000 validator candidates and only spot for 700 of them or something and you you have all this mapping of you know people have nominated a bunch of different validators um, and you need to figure out like what's the optimal solution um, what's the optimal 100 that will have the most amount at stake in the system um, like what what set of validators will provide the most security and optimization problems in general in engineering tend to be very computationally heavy and take a long time so we can actually do this in other ways. So like one would be to just like move this into a parachain where it only does these validator elections and um, it can just run for a long time and submit um, its transactions occasionally. Um, and we also have this idea of like an off-chain worker, which is how we do the validator elections now. So it'll actually like take a snapshot of the state, go run this long computation off-chain um, and you could do this with anything. So um, it doesn't have to just be validators. You can just put any kind of logic that you want into these and they'll run off chain and then come back and submit their solution when they're ready. So it doesn't even have to like be in the chain or hold it up. If you have one of these like really big computations where you need to have these like hundreds of thousands of transactions per second or something, you can just say like, okay, we're gonna pull this off. We're gonna do this. We're gonna let the blockchain advance 10, 20, 100 blocks or whatever. And then when this transaction is done being processed, we can just report the results back to the chain. Exactly, exactly. That makes a lot of sense. But I mean, already 800 to 1,000 transactions per second relative to the current ETH, which is 15 transactions per second, is already quite glorious, right? It's already quite comfortable. So first of all, I, I must say that, you know, for all the Ethereum lovers out there, like we, this is just the worst case scenario type of discussion, you know, where we support Ethereum 100% and hope this is successful. But you know what, it, what really reassures me, Joe, is the fact that, you know, Polkadot is not a competitor to Ethereum. Polkadot here is complementing Ethereum. But if Ethereum does fail, there is a plan B. That That's what reassures me the most, right, for all these DeFi projects. And I'd love to hear from you, Joe. Like, obviously, we have the Polkadot Decoded event coming soon, which seems super exciting. The agenda is amazing. Uh, how is DeFi on Polkadot? How does that sound to you? Is this uh, doable? How, how do you see the progress? Obviously, you don't want to reveal everything. And don't forget, guys, to join the Polkadot Decoded event. But how, how does this sound to you, DeFi on Polkadot? Yeah, uh, we've had quite a lot of interest in this. So um, yeah, we have a lot of teams building DeFi applications either in their own parachains or on smart contract chains. So we have, I think, like three or four teams building smart contract chains. So obviously, in touch with a lot of teams who are doing DeFi and want to deploy there. Um, we have some teams that are actually building like just native DeFi parachains. Um, so yeah, I, I'm quite optimistic about that. I think we'll see quite a bit of that. And and I think the governance stuff really helps because you can have like these parachains that can, um, it really has all of the primitives to allow um, like blockchain governance and, le and let, you, let your community evolve the application. Do you think that's the key to success for Polkadot? Like Joe, when you think about the fact that they can create their own entire society with their own rules, with their own procedures, is that what makes it sound sexy to develop on Polkadot rather than you know abiding by the rules of another chain? Yeah, the governance part is definitely one of it. And then exactly like you said, like abiding by the rules of another chain. So when you're deploying on another chain, like if you're a smart contract and you're deploying on a smart contract chain, you're still beholden to that smart contract chain and their decisions going forward. Um, whereas if you actually run your own blockchain, you have a lot more uh, design space, a lot more freedom to actually 
design this uh, exclusively for your application and optimize it for that. Um, and then just the ability to upgrade, um, fix errors, and, and continually evolve the project without like redeploying contracts or anything. It's a huge advantage. It's massive. It's kind of like you create your own world within a world. You know what I mean? Without having to, you know, go through all the restrictions or if you don't agree with a certain person, it's really you can build your own society, right? Is that the is that the mission at the moment of I'm going back to the mission again, but uh, how do you see the mission evolving in the future? Is that what you guys want to do is to be able to help people build decentralized societies and, and build their own world in, in some sense through Web3? Yeah, so we've likened this before to organizations like NATO or something, where it's an organization of member states. So all of these parachains, um, they have their own governance systems, they have their own rules, they have their own kind of definition of what it means to be a member of that community, that parachain. And then we have like Polkadot itself, which is really like a community of communities. So like these parachains are kind of like member states in the Polkadot organization, and it has its own system of governance, but it still leaves a lot of freedom and sovereignty to the individual parachains. Um, so they can still have their own governance, change their own rules, um, evolve as they need. Um, they're really still just, they're using Polkadot as a service to validate, um, to give them security and context and validate those rules and as, as a platform to communicate and share trust with other entities that are also members of the system. And one last question. So in terms of, you know, the DOT and KSM tokens, so these tokens will allow these parachains to create this decentralized governance. Is that the sole purpose of, of the tokens? And if you could elaborate a little bit on the utilities. Yeah, so the token is really meant to provide three roles. So one is the staking and security. So how do we actually secure the network? Um, the second is governance. How do we steer the direction of, of the network? What kind of decisions do we make? Um, what kind of upgrades do we make? What kind of features do we add? Um, and then the third is actually this parachain allocation. So we have like a limited number of, of slots here. You, you know, we have val you're asking Polkadot to validate your parachain, right? So we actually have to send a validator to your parachain to to, to do that. And um, that takes validators. We need to have people actually running this infrastructure. And so there are a limited number of parachains. And we have an auction system where you use DOT or KSM to bid on the slot. Um, and then that's how we determine like what the set of parachains is. Um, and so that's like the three main roles of the token um, is yeah, parachain bonding, governance, and also staking and security. Staking and security, beautiful, awesome. Joe, before we go, if we want to hear more information, obviously there's a website, Polkadot. If we want to follow you, are you more active on Twitter these days, LinkedIn? What are some uh, useful links that was for us to get more engaged? Oh, uh, I have Twitter, but I'm not super active there. Um, <laughs> but yeah, you can you can check out um, my Twitter or LinkedIn. Um, and or my website, um, which has my other contact info there. There you go, guys. We covered everything from Polkadot to Kasama to KSM to DOT to decentralized governance leading to decentralized societies through parachains, relay chains, KSM doc, and all that cool stuff. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and blast that bell notification so you can get access to more of this awesome content. And let us know how you feel about Polkadot and Kusama in the comments box below. Thank you so much for watching and join us every Wednesday, premiering at a PC near you, 8 o'clock GMT. Thank you so much and see you next week, guys.